Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about the Peasants' Revolt. This episode, A World Turned Upside Down, we will talk about how an attempt by the government of King Richard II to collect a poll tax started a revolt that turned into a national uprising. An army of peasants surrounded the city of London, gained entry, and smashed one of the greatest palaces in the kingdom. And after a meeting between the rebels and King Richard II at Miles End, the Archbishop of Canterbury himself was beheaded by an angry mob. For centuries, the feudal system held firm in England, as it did across Europe. Yet all that came apart in the 1300s, when famine, war, and the Black Death stretched society to the breaking point. In 1381, the government of 14-year-old King Richard II snapped the final thread with a poll tax that started a peasant uprising. After only 12 days of revolt, the government lost control of most of southeastern England, the richest part of the kingdom. The rebels included some of the richest farmers and merchants in England, people from all walks of life, not to mention different villages and regions, gathered together on the road to London. And along the way, they ransacked the houses of tax collectors, seizing documents and tax seals, and making bonfires of them. Tax collectors were dragged into the street and beheaded. However, the peasants firmly believed that King Richard II was really on their side, and that he had only been led astray by his evil advisors, Archbishop Simon Sudbury and his uncle John of Gaunt. The peasants believed that these two men convinced the king to raise the poll tax in order to line their own pockets. The town of Cressing Temple, the headquarters of the Knights Hospitaller in England, became a rendezvous point for hundreds of peasants making the trip to London to see King Richard II. And there, peasants who had never seen buildings larger than a parish church saw tithe barns for the Knights Hospitaller that stood 30 or 40 feet tall, jam-packed with peas, beans, and wheat, all collected in taxes from the peasants of England. While the rebels spared the barns, which they saw as useful buildings, they burned the refectories and dormitories of the monks who ran Cressing Temple, sucking food out of England and sending it abroad to the Knights Hospitlar. And after the rebels stopped to eat from the Hospitlar barns, they continued to London, burning tax documents as they went. But the rebellion didn't just head south to London, it also went further north. As the peasants spread word of the uprising, no tax collector was safe. Some collectors fled along the coast by boat as their properties were ransacked by peasant rebels. On June 15th, the revolt spread to Cambridgeshire, the site of the University of Cambridge, itself deeply resented by the rebels, not only for the royal privileges which set them above the townspeople, but its ties to John of Gaunt. Peasant rebels that were backed by the mayor of Cambridge ransacked the college and the church, then burned the library archives, which also happened to house the tax records. The university had to grant a new charter in which it gave up its royal privileges. And this episode shows us that the peasants were a very sophisticated bunch, deliberately targeting the tax records that oppressed them, and they were often backed not just by impoverished landless laborers, but by the upper classes as well, including mayors and rich merchants. While this drama unfolded in Cambridge, Watt Tyler and his men headed east towards London, while rebels from Kent headed towards Blackheath on the capital outside London. And the rebels from Kent and the rebels from Essex formed two separate camps on different sides of the Thames River. The peasants would have had a small corps of riders coordinating the villages and bringing in men from across England. Small bands of people steadily trickled in, gradually forming a force somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 rebels. John Ball, a radical priest recently freed from prison, assured the rebels that the aristocracy was not created by God, but by man. So the aristocracy could and should be destroyed. The peasants gathered around campfires, often using tax documents and land records as fuel. People in London could have seen the rebel army growing bigger and bigger and the bonfires that they made out of the hated tax documents. 
panic gripped London. England had no standing army and no police force at the time. Most of the professional soldiers were fighting in Scotland or in Europe. King Richard II himself was only 14 years old and his ministers were totally unprepared. With nowhere else to go, Richard and his court withdrew to the Tower of London. While the defenses of the tower were strong enough to keep the king safe, he could only wait for information as the rebels closed in on him. By the 15th day of the revolt, King Richard II agreed to a meeting with the rebels. In a grossly impractical arrangement, the king and his advisors got on barges at the Tower of London and met the rebel army while floating on the river at Rutherhide and trying to shout to the rebels who were on the shore. Through one of his advisors, the king ordered the rebels to go home. Not impressed in the least, the rebels in turn demanded that King Richard hand over his chancellor, his treasurer, and the keeper of the Lord Privy Seal for them to punish. Some of those men were almost certainly on the barges with King Richard at that time. Not surprisingly, the flotilla simply turned around and went back to the tower. Soon after, the peasants began breaking open the jails in surrounding towns, freeing prisoners to swell their numbers. Soldiers on their way to Europe deserted and joined the rebels, swelling their ranks even further. And it wasn't just the peasants joining. The local notables, like rectors, wine merchants, and even minor officials, were joining up the rebellion. Despite their growing numbers, the rebels still faced one problem. How did they get into London? The only way into the city was crossing London Bridge. So the rebels put some of those rich, respectable citizens up front and convinced the guards at the river to lower the drawbridge. And in this way, the rebels crossed into London. A hundred thousand rebels flooded the streets of a city which then only numbered about 50,000. Some Londoners turned out to welcome the peasant rebels with gifts of food and beer. For a time, the rebels played tourist, staring at the 500-foot-tall buildings, the expensive beer, and stunning new conveniences like the public toilet. However, it didn't take the peasants long to get back to work. There would be no mercy for those whom they believed had betrayed the king. And for the peasant rebels, John of Gaunt was the arch-traitor. If John of Gaunt had been in London, he would have probably been murdered then and there. However, John had traveled to the Scottish border during the time of the rebellion, which probably saved his life. So the peasants instead took their anger out on John's palace, the Savoy. One of the grandest palaces in England, it was a storehouse of treasure, jewelry, robes, beautiful furniture, finery, and cash, which the rebels believed had been paid for by the poll tax. The peasants burst in, slashed John's clothes with knives, fired flaming arrows into the upper floors, and cut up his gold plate and threw it in the Thames River. Then they smashed his furniture furniture with axes. However, one peasant who tried looting silver from the Savoy was hung from a tree. The peasants saw the destruction of the Savoy as a political protest, not a chance to take treasure that had already been stolen from fellow peasants. After setting off a gunpowder cache in the Savoy to finish it off, they headed to Lawyer's Inn. The gutters filled with the blood, guts, and heads of attorneys, whom the peasants blamed for enforcing the hated tax laws. For years afterwards, the Savoy remained wrecked as a reminder of what happened when the peasants rose up. As working-class Londoners joined the revolt, they targeted the community of Flemish people living in London. As foreigners making money off the wine and wool trade in the city, they were blamed by London workers for their own problems. Any person could be grabbed off the street, shoved against the wall, and ordered to say bread and cheese. If they used the Flemish phrase bunt und casa, they were dragged into the streets and their heads cut off. Back in the Tower of London, King Richard's court held a desperate debate over what to do. King Richard II agreed to more delaying tactics. He promised to meet the rebels again, this time face to face. On June 14th, King Richard rode to Miles End to meet the Essex rebels. The royal party was terrified, and for good reason. They'd lost control, and they didn't have a way to fight back. Richard faced a mob of 30,000 peasants, and they demanded for the right to work for any lord they wanted, 
to sell their produce as they chose and for land rent to be reduced to four pence an acre. Taken together, this would have meant the end of feudalism in England, and King Richard II agreed to it. To make sure Richard kept his word, the rebels got the king's promise in writing. Then the rebels demanded the head of Archbishop Sudbury, the tax collector in chief. When the king made a vague reply about giving the peasants justice, the rebels took that as a signal to storm the Tower of London. When the rebels arrived, they found the drawbridge open, which they took as a sign that the king intended to deliver Sudbury to them. Once inside, the peasants were overwhelmed by the luxury that they saw. They began tearing through the vast halls and jumping up and down on the beds. But most of the peasants remembered that they hadn't come here to play. Simon Sudbury was caught trying to climb into a boat. The rebels seized him, then chopped off his head with eight brutal blows. The severed head of the Archbishop of Canterbury was paraded through the streets of London on a pike in celebration. Nobles were dragged out of church and had their heads chopped off on makeshift blocks until they turned black with congealed blood. Almost 200 people were killed on these improvised chopping blocks. It looked as if the rebels had won a complete victory. They'd had a promise from the king to effectively abolish feudalism. They'd taken revenge on at least one of the two arch criminals, and they seemed to have almost taken over the country. The only person who could change things now was the 14-year-old King Richard II, who so far didn't look like he was up to the job. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.